spearfishing has or will strike your business, wreaking havoc on your employees, brand, and your bottom line. Spearfishing can't be stopped by traditional email security solutions because messages appear to be legitimate from your boss, a trusted colleague, or a vendor asking you to wire money, confirm login credentials, or worse. Barracuda Sentinel is artificial intelligence for real-time spear phishing and cyber fraud defense. Reclaim your email in minutes with zero impact on network performance. Visit barracuda.com slash AI. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. NBA playoff action took place. It began in earnest for 2018 this past Saturday. And practically every game was great, with the exception of Golden State, San Antonio. That was just the Golden State Warriors reminding the San Antonio Spurs. And everybody, if you thought we would disappear, you must have forgot. You must have forgot who we are. Yes, we can flip that switch whenever we want to, especially against a team devoid of its best player in Kawhi Leonard, devoid and having a guy in LaMarcus Aldridge who's allergic to prosperity come postseason time, at least half the games he plays in the postseason. But, again, we'll get into all of that later. Right now, for me, even though it's just one game, even though the MVP race is decided based on what you do in a regular season, I want to sit up there and say thank you to the great James Harden for illuminating and augmenting my point. I said it weeks ago. I said it days ago. I said it hours ago, and I'm going to say it again. James Harden is the MVP of the 2017-2018 NBA season. And anybody who wants to sit up there and have the temerity, the unmitigated goal to get on my damn nerves with something to refute this, ah, I don't even want to talk to you, to be quite honest with you. I'm not going to run from anybody on my own radio show, but I ain't going to lie to you. I don't even want to talk to you. Because to me, when I look at that show that he put on last night, Lord have mercy, was he sensational. This is the kind of stuff that you, you, you sat up there and you used to have in L.A. with Kobe that you wish you had in New York ever. No disrespect and my apologies to the great Bernard King, but y'all know what I'm saying. When you look at James Harden and the performance that he put forth last night, 15 to 26 shooting, 44 points, he was absolutely sensational. There is no way about it. It was special and everything he did was needed because Clint Capella was the only person that showed up on the offensive side of the ball with James Harden. Everybody else, I don't know what happened to them. Chris Paul, aberration, no big deal. They were minus four with him on the court. He only hit like five or 12 shots, but they ain't no big deal. It's Chris Paul. We'll get over it. We will definitely get over it. Actually, five or 14 from the field. Finished with 14 points. And just four assists. That is not the Chris Paul that I know and love. But again, that's an aberration. I expect better, big and better things in the playoff games ahead. Trevor Reza, P.J. Tucker, Eric Gordon took the night off offensively. Took the night off offensively. Trevor Reza and P.J. Tucker started. They were 1-for-11 combined for six points. Each of them had three points. Each of them only hit one field goal. Each of them played more than 30, 30 minutes. Come on now. You need more than that. You need more than that from them. And we can look there and we'll talk about Minnesota as we get more into this particular game because Carl Anthony Towns can't play 40 minutes and just give me nine po- eight points and just nine shots. That cannot happen. That cannot happen if you call Anthony Towns. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Here's the deal. The MVP conversation is relevant. Why? Because of what we saw in Cleveland. Because if you're not talking about James Harden, even though a name like Anthony Davis comes into the fold and to a lesser degree of Damian Lillard, what you're talking about is James Harden or LeBron James. And everybody wants to sit up there and they want to give LeBron James credit because he still had a triple-double and he still showed up. But they got waxed by Indiana because Victor Oladipo has arrived. It is official. This brother is no joke. He's not playing. He's letting everybody know that he deserves to be mentioned amongst the stars in the National Basketball Association. And he showed us why yesterday with his 32-point outing and the show that he put on doing what he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted against a Cleveland Cavaliers team that was ill-equipped to defend against him, no question. But outside of the performance being about Oladipo or Indiana's defense and how their ball pressure seemed to be a bit too much for Cleveland, you know what jumped out in my mind once again? 
This is going to be the perfect excuse for people to sit up there and say, LeBron James, this is just further proof that he's the MVP. He's the most valuable player because you guess what, Stephen A? Here's the reality of the situation. What does he have around him? What does he have around him? Well, you know what my response to that is? Whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? That's point number one. And point number two, if indeed you want to sit up there and look at it, From that perspective, how come I can't look at it from the perspective that I just asked you? Whose fault is that? Because when I look at the MVP to be, as far as I'm concerned, in James Harden, I'm also looking at a James Harden that got a guy like Chris Paul, who's a superstar point guard, who wanted to leave the city of angels, Tinseltown, Hollywood, and everything that it comes with, who wanted to leave to come and play with James Harden while you had a star guard. And Kyrie Irving, who wanted to leave away from LeBron James. I don't understand how people can't get this. It ain't just about what you do on the court. It's about what you did to affect what transpired on the court. LeBron James has everything to do. I'm not disrespecting the man here. I know he's the best player in the world. That's not what this is about. What this is about is the fact that you instigated a process that left you devoid of your ultimate weapon. Because I guarantee you, if Kyrie Irving was on the floor with LeBron James yesterday, what you saw from the rest of the Cleveland Cavaliers would not have happened. There's no way on earth that that happens if Kyrie Irving is there with LeBron James. It doesn't happen. You don't see a team that can't shoot. You don't see a team that can't handle the ball. A team that can't handle the ball with Kyrie Irving on it? Have you lost your mind? If LeBron wasn't handling the ball, the ball would have been in Kyrie's hands. And who who on God's green earth is going to accuse Kyrie Irving of not being able to handle the rock? Who probably has the best handle in basketball? Who's going to accuse them of that? But Indiana got all up in them, and they could barely do anything with the basketball. Kevin Love can't dribble the ball. Kyle Korver can't dribble the ball. J.R. Smith can't dribble the ball, not really. Clarkson Clarkson can dribble the ball, but he ain't on that level of Kyrie. George Hill is Mr. Conservative. I mean, if he was a politician instead of a basketball player, he he, he put Ted Cruz to shame with his conservative ways on a basketball court. You got to be kidding me. George Hill, is a, it's, 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 it's asking a lot for him to put the ball behind his back. He just doesn't do it. I'm not saying he can't. I'm saying he doesn't. He's just a very conservative, vanilla kind of player. And when you look at it, when you look at him and you watch him on the court, he's going to make shots from time to time, but that's about it. He's going to make shots from time to time. He's going to defend. That's what Paul George, I'm sorry, George Hill, that's what George Hill does. That's who he is. That's his game. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing too fancy, nothing too crazy. That's George Hill. And if you're LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers, you're in a world of trouble. You know why? Because Nate McMillan, being the exceptional coach that he is, a top three coach of the year candidate as far as I'm concerned, by the way, you got guys on the court. Look at this lineup. Bojan Bogdanovich, Victor Oladipo, Miles Turner, Thaddeus Young, and Darren Collison. And they ran the Cleveland Cavaliers out the building. Now, if you're LeBron, you might be assessing things. You might take the opportunity to sit up there and say, you know what? This is the deal. We felt them out. We're going to do all right. We still held them to 98 points. We're better than people thought we were going to be. We're going to be just fine. If you're LeBron James, that's your approach. I understand that. It makes sense. But you only scored 80 for a reason. And LeBron could do what he wants with Lance Stevenson pestering him. Gave him 17 strong minutes off the bench. Scored 12 points. Was in LeBron James' face. A couple of cheap fouls. Cheap Bush Bush League fouls. One of them should have definitely been a flagrant when he knocked LeBron upside the head. No question about that. But here's the reality. When you look at the Indiana Pacers, what do you see? You see a bunch of blue-collar dudes who don't care about who they're going up against. And you see a star in Oladipo who seems totally and utterly unfazed by big moments. 
They up 23. Cleveland pulls to within eight. The crowd's going crazy. Nate McMillan calls a timeout. Oladipo's like, give me the ball. Then sits with their pounds down. I got this. I got this. Not even concerned. Backs up, comes full steam ahead, has you on your heels, and then pulls up for a jumper. That's what he does. At will. And Cleveland seemed ill-equipped to stop him. He finished the game with 32 on 11 of 19 shooting, hitting 6 of 9 from three-point range. He is that dude. And Miles Turner getting the shot back, Bogdanovich being somewhat of a threat, Lance Stevenson coming off the bench. Look, Indiana is not playing. They're not. T- they're tired of Cleveland. Now, I had Cleveland coming out of the East because my attitude is, I want to see who's going to beat LeBron the best four out of seven. I had no idea that these brothers on his squad were going to fail to show up, going to look indifferent as apathetic as ever. I go inside. I'm in Houston, Texas today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in Houston, Texas, because I was there last night for game one. I'm in H-Town, baby, and I walk into that locker room, and before I even had a chance to ask dudes about their own team, guys were asking me, what the hell is going on with LeBron? What happened to him? Because he came out there last night, didn't even attempt a shot in the first quarter. Reminded me of James Harden in the game six against the Spurs last year in the Western Conference semifinals, where he didn't attempt a shot. Offensive players usually don't do that. But that's what LeBron did yesterday. And you got to wonder why. And not only do you have to wonder why, okay, in terms of his personnel, you also have to wonder how interested he is in moving forward with this team. And if he has questions about that, then you know that means he's probably not going to stay in Cleveland. And if he's not going to stay in Cleveland, where the hell is he going to go? It ain't going to be New York. L.A. with magic. Oh, yes. A lot of people think so since the man got two twenty 20-plus million dollar homes in Brentwood. You take that into account, is Miami a possibility? No, not after watching them against Philly this weekend, because let me tell you something right now. Philly is legit, ladies and gentlemen. Philly is legit. And it ain't just because of Ben Simmons. It's because of Redick and Bellinelli and Covington and Sarek. You got shooters around size and size that's willing to defend. And if they are willing to defend and they can shoot, no wonder they've won 17 straight. 16 straight to end the regular season, plus this playoff game against Miami. One minute it was competitive. The next minute the game is over, Philly wins by 27. It's one game, but had Dwayne Wade looking like he should retire. Only played 19 minutes, hit four or seven shots, scored 11 points. But why would Eric Sposter not have him more active, particularly when Richardson and guys like that are shooting one for six or one for seven? What's the problem? Miami just doesn't appear to have the talent to deal with the Sixers, and the Sixers blew him out without Joel Embiid. Yes, Kelly Olenek had 26 points. But Hassan Whiteside, who you gave $93 million to, was basically irrelevant. And that was with Joel Embiid off the floor. So what are you going to do when he comes back? See, these are the interesting parts. Everybody's been talking about the Toronto Raptors. We haven't talked enough about the Philadelphia 76ers. They might represent the Eastern Conference in the NBA Finals. You better ask somebody. And how can we rule them out if you have that level of size and you have that many shooters and you have a rookie sensation in Ben Simmons with a best, arguably the best big man in basketball in Joel Embiid and you defend? Have we missed something here? Have we truly, truly missed something here? I might have done it. Focus so much on LeBron thinking that you know what? I got to see somebody beat him four straight. I still feel that way, but I got to tell you something right now. Strong level of trepidation. Strong level of trepidation on my part. Because I'm not sure about Cleveland and LeBron anymore. Not as bad as they looked. I'm still going to roll with them. But they got to win game two. They got to win game two. Now, some of you might sit up there and say, Stephen A., that's why he's the MVP. Oh, hell no. I'm not going for that, ladies and gentlemen. Nope. 
you don't get to essentially facilitate the departure of a Kyrie Irving, turn around, watch D-Wade come on board, because you're so tight with him, you alienate everybody else on your squad, not in a negative fashion where they thought you were a bad person. I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to say that the brotherhood that you have with Dwayne Wade is so tight that the relationship with other guys on the team suffered somewhat. You don't get to do all of that. Compromise those relationships because of the arrival of, of because of the arrival of Dwayne Wade, which came after you facilitated the departure of Kyrie Irving, which ultimately ended up facilitating the departure of Isaiah Thomas and Jamie Crowder, who's starting in Utah. You don't get to do all of that. And everybody says, but look at what LeBron James did. And you get MVP. No, 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 no. Don't work that way. You're the leader, right? you that dude, right? James Harden didn't have that problem. And there are people like, you know, you've got people that talk about how James Harden is a beneficiary of his teammates. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. James Harden has averaged better than 29 points the last three years. How many more excuses are we going to come up with to deprive this man of what he has earned? When did it stop? The dude averaged 30 this year with more than eight assists. He's clearly the go-to guy night in and night out. Every time he's on the floor, he's a scoring machine. He hits in the high 80s from the free throw line. He has point guard responsibilities. He has shooting guard responsibilities. With the real, Chris Paul, he did the same damn thing. Last year, he led the league in assists. I had him winning the award until the last two weeks of the season when Russell Westbrook just went haywire. Went berserk. How many more times is James Harden going to be denied? It's not just about timing. It's about greatness. He isn't old this because he was deprived the last two years. He's old this because he's doing it. How many different ways do you want this to go down? How many different ways do you want an excuse to deprive this man of league MVP honors? What else do you need to see? And oh, by the way, he's 15 games better than LeBron James was this year. Does that matter? In a tougher conference than the Eastern Conference. Does that matter? With a superstar point guard that wanted to come play with him, not one who wanted to leave him. Does that matter? He ain't by himself in those State Farm commercials. Obviously facilitated by Chris Paul, who's been doing State Farm commercials for years, but it ain't an accident that all of them are in there. And oh, by the way, talk to the folks in Vegas. There's only two teams that really got a shot at the championship. It's Houston or Golden State. Ain't nobody else. Me personally, I'm starting to think Philly because of their ability to defend plus their ability to hit perimeter shots. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I can't ignore this any longer. I'm not going to ignore Philly, and I'm not going to ignore what James Harden has earned. He deserves this. Give it to him. He is the league MVP. I don't want to hear this noise about LeBron James. Nobody's taking away from the greatness of LeBron James. But you don't get to sit up there and compromise the success of your team and then benefit from it because you got numbers. Doesn't work that way. James Harden is the league MVP. And oh, by the way, I am a complete and, and vehement adversary of these bogus player association. Uh, 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 what is it? What is, what is it called? I, I don't even want to know what to call it. Is it a celebration? Is it an event? What is it? As far as I'm concerned, 
One of the biggest, most egregious things that I've seen is when Russell Westbrook got MVP award in front of those folks at a banquet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you the MVP. If James Harden's going to be that MVP, I want that MVP handed to James Harden in front of these fans in Houston who showed up 41 nights a year throughout the regular season to cheer him on. I'm quite sure that if James Harden has an opportunity to hoist the MVP trophy, he would want it to be in front of his teammates and a packed side inside of the Toyota Center instead of a damn banquet inside of a hotel in New York City. After the season's over, talk about stealing the moment and making something anticlimactic. Give it to him right here in Houston, in front of these fans. The very ones that cheered him on and screamed his name and sparked him to the greatness that he's exhibited throughout this season. Now, mind you, I'm the same dude who told you. that Houston's going to lose in the conference finals. Because I still believe in my heart of hearts, if Golden State is fully loaded and Houston is fully loaded, Golden State wins a game seven back here at the Toyota Center in H-Town, Houston, Texas, where I am today. I still go with Golden State, but nothing takes away from the great season that James Harden had, has had. And even the great LeBron James shouldn't be allowed to take away from it either. Because to do so this year, you're basically saying everybody needs to be LeBron. That's what you're saying. And clearly, that's not the case. Craving even more of Stephen A? Him of all people! For around-the-clock access to the man? I'm Stephen A! You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Stephen A. Smith and on Facebook at Stephen A. What is it, Linda? I think we should see other people. Are you breaking up with me on a roller coaster? Well, we do have a lot of fun. Maybe we should stay together. An emotional roller coaster? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. I just need a little me time. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Let me be very, very clear, because I want to make sure that nobody confuses what my point is. I support Colin Kaepernick's right to kneel. I have no issue with it whatsoever. I've supported him from day one in that regard. Having said all of that, I also understand that there's ramifications and repercussions that come along with it. Fair or unfair, that's the reality. And Colin Kaepernick clearly knew it. And these are the stances. This is the position that he's willing to take. Now, but let's be clear about something. Let's make sure we understand what's going on here. Colin Kaepernick. And I want you I want to put it in an order of secret so everybody understands where I'm coming from. So there's no I don't mind being held accountable for what I say and feel. I just hate when it's misconstrued and misinterpreted. Condemn me, vilify me, do whatever you want. As long as you're accurate about how I feel, I'm good. I'm good with it because I can take it because I don't give a damn. I say what I mean and I mean what I say. I'm just going to fight over the interpret the false interpretations that get put out there. So let me be very, very clear about what I'm saying. Colin Kaepernick was right. Perfectly within his right to do what he did. OK. But here's how things changed. The president of the United States, Donald Trump, hijacked the issue, hijacked the narrative and turned an issue about racial inequality, racial oppression, uh, black unemployment, Law enforcement brutality. Donald Trump took that and turned it into an issue involving patriotism. He made it about the red, white and blue, the flag. Now, black folks and minorities overall are in an uproar talking about how that's not what Colin Kaepernick was talking about. Blah, 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 blah. I say blah, 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 because it doesn't matter. You're absolutely right. That's not Colin Kaepernick's issue. It was never his issue, but it did not stop them. From stealing the narrative for their own selfish purposes. And what Donald Trump did. Was make it about patriotism. 66% of America's population is white. A vast majority of them happen to be white working class. Which is where he got most of his votes from. 
which also happens to be most of the people who patronize the NFL product. And as a result, because he successfully changed and altered the narrative and made it about something that it wasn't, it compromised the NFL's bottom line. Once it compromised their bottom line, the priority for the owners became the bottom line. Not that it ever deviated from that, but more specifically and more intimately, that's what it became more about. Now, Donald Donald Trump himself, the president of the United States, whether we like it or not, he had his own selfish motives. He said, I wanted to become a known in the 80s when I was owning the USFL. That's why we sued them for one point seven billion dollars antitrust in the mid 1980s. He won the case, but he was only rewarded one dollar. And it basically ruined the USFL. Then in 2014, him befriending several owners, including New England's Robert Kraft, uh, Mr. McNair in Houston, okay, Daniel Snyder in Washington and others. What does Donald Trump do? He wants to become an owner of the Buffalo Bills. What happens? He wants to own the Buffalo Bills. NFL owners shun him on that. They denied it. He said at the time, okay, I'll just run for president. How would I know this? Because I was on the phone interviewing Donald Trump at that time. That's how. And that's exactly what he said. And so we have to understand that what is the relationship between Donald Trump and Colin Kaepernick? It's simple. Both of them have essentially been kept out of the NFL because of their willingness to affect the NFL's bottom line in a negative fashion. Donald Trump with the antitrust lawsuit, Colin Kaepernick with the protest. Because if you're an NFL owner, you're saying, wait a minute. He's not protesting against me. He doesn't have a problem with me. He has a problem with society. Well, why is he allowing it to affect our bottom line, our cash cow? Especially when you can't even complete 60% of your passes, but you've made over $40 million in our league. So they said, damn that. Just the same way to Donald Trump, they said, damn that. Now it's two different worlds coming from two different stratospheres. One has nothing to do with the other, but the bottom line is the same. In the eyes of the NFL owners, it don't matter whether you're a black dude protesting the national anthem because of societal issues that affect the minority community, or you're a white billionaire, essentially a part of our community, but who happen to try and affect our bottom line. It doesn't make a difference to us. You are trying to affect our bottom line negatively. You've got to go. That is how Colin Kaepernick and Donald Trump belong in the same sentence. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.